And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage the co-director of tonight's performance, the simply brilliant actor, Stephen Ray. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I have a few people to thank. Pamela Tillis, the Director of Public Programs at the New School. Mark Fitzpatrick, Director of Events IT. And Kula, New York City, which is New York City's first annual Irish cultural festival. Check out the program for further events, including two one-person shows from Belfast. Uh, I have to thank Culture Island, Ireland and Haymarket Books, who are selling books in the lobby. And uh, I also need to say that um, tonight's show is dedicated to the great socialist lawyer, Michael Ratner. Yeah. Uh, he passed earlier this week. He is a lion of social justice, and we honor him and remember him. Uh, this is all happening because I, I did a film once with Colin Firth, and he, before I knew it, he'd invited me to do The People Speak in London. And there I met Anthony Arnove, uh, who's a, an amazing guy with incredible energy and brilliance. And uh, I said to him, um, I, I think we should do this in Ireland. And he agreed, so here I am in New York. And, uh, and this is going to be a warm-up for us because we are going to do it in Ireland. And if you want to know what exercises us, it's, if you look what's happening in Ireland, uh, at the moment there are more homeless in Ireland than there have ever been. There uh, are 30,000 people who have no access to legal aid. Um, there's a thing called direct provision, which is where uh, asylum seekers are maintained on 19 euro a week and have no real rights and can't get education. So um, while we want to celebrate 1916, we want to, to also understand that uh, our country hasn't achieved the uh, liberty we would like it to have for all its citizens. Um, uh, and indeed, 1916 has been celebrated in Ireland with a kind of nostalgic forgetfulness um, rather than dealing. And what we want to do here is um, show you some of the emotions and language that uh, informed the protests uh, that led to independence. So that's that. So um, we open tonight's show with the folk song, Follow Me Up to Carlo which recounts the struggles of Irish clan leaders against English rule in the late 16th century. The song's central character, Fiach McHugh O'Byrne, defeated 3,000 English soldiers at the Battle of Glenmalure in 1580, and the air is said to have been played by his pipers during the battle. Um, Old Hannah will then play Irish Boys, a song about the people of Ireland who emigrated to the United States in search of a better life, bringing with them their music and culture and adapting to life in a country where they would become integral to building roads and infrastructure. Tone was the leader of the United Irishmen, a group inspired by the French Revolution, who worked to unite Catholics and Protestants against British rule in Ireland. For his activities, he was sentenced to be hanged. Here is an excerpt of his trial in 1798. <laughs> On the eve of Ireland's great famine, Abolitionist, social reformer, and former slave, Frederick Douglass visited Dublin, Belfast, and Cork, where he was greeted with enthusiastic crowds. Douglass formed many friendships on his trip, most significantly with Daniel O'Connell, who was renowned for his role in Catholic emancipation and his fierce opposition to slavery. Writing to his friend William Lloyd Garrison in 1846, Douglas describes the conditions he encountered during his visit. In my letter to you...
During the US war on Mexico, a group of Irish soldiers serving in the US military switched sides to join the Mexican army and take up arms against expansion into Mexican soil. They were called the San Patricios. Here, they explain their cause. <laughs> By the mid-1800s, around one million Irish people had died of starvation and famine-related disease, and a million more emigrated, in large part, to America. In his poem, Old Ireland, Walt Whitman invokes the horror of the situation which drove the diaspora and proclaims a message of hope for Irish America. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, English forces cut down most of Ireland's trees and shipped them away both to build ships for its navy and to prevent rebels from hiding in the forests. This anonymous song, Queen Kilchash, is an Irish lament of the era when the native Irish earls had fled, the old aristocracy that had supported Irish bards had been dispossessed by the Anglo-Irish, the old castles were in ruins, and the trees were falling fast. It's interesting to note that before the Elizabethan conquest, Ireland was the most forested country in Europe, and it is still to this day the least forested. Then we're going to hear a song, uh, Roisin, the Irish for Rosaline, Little Rose. It's a name traditionally used to personify Ireland. In this song, Luke Kelly of the Dubliners revisits the spirit of nationalist rebellion and asks what the sacrifice had been for. James Connolly was the founder of the Independent Labour Party of Ireland. We want to say a few words in praise of the empire. Now, don't get startled or shocked, nor yet think we are only sarcastic. We are not abandoning our principles, nor forgetting our wrongs, nor giving up as hopeless the fight for our rights, nor yet exercising the slave's last privilege, that of sneering at his masters. We do not love the empire. We hate it with an unqualified hatred, but nevertheless we admire it. Why should we not? Consider well what this empire is doing today, and then see if you can withhold your admiration. At the present moment, this empire has dominions spread all over the seven seas. Everywhere it holds down races and nations that it might use them as its slaves, that it might use their territories as sources of rent and interest for its aristocratic rulers, that it might prevent their development as self-supporting entities and compel them to remain dependent customers of English produce, that it might be able to strangle every race or nation that would enter the field as a competitor against British capitalism or assert its independence of the British capitalist. To do this, it stifles the ancient culture of India, strangles in its birth the newborn liberty of Egypt, smothers in the blood of 10,000 women and children the republics of South Africa, betrays into the hands of Russian despotism the trusting nationalists of Persia, connives at the partition of China, and plans the partition of Ireland. North, south, east, and west, it has set its foot upon the neck of peoples, plundering and murdering and mocking as it outraged. In the name of a superior civilization, it has crushed the development of native genius, and in the name of superior capitalist development, it has destroyed the native industries of a sixth of the human race. In the name of liberty, it hangs and imprisons patriots. And whilst calling high heaven to witness its horror of militarism, it sends the shadow of its swords between countless millions and their hopes of freedom. Despite all this, despite the fact that every day the winds of the earth are laden with the curses which its unwilling subjects in countless millions prey upon its flag, yet that flag flies triumphantly over every one of its possessions even whilst its soldiers are reeling discomfited and beaten before the trenches of Turk and German. The British Empire never fought a white European foe single-handed, never dared yet to confront an equal unaided. Yet it has laid upon its subjects everywhere from Ireland to India and from India to Africa the witchcraft of belief in its luck, so that even whilst they see it beaten to its knees, they are possessed with the conviction that it will pull through in some fashion. 
without that belief, without that conviction of the slaves that their master must remain in possession of his mastership, the British Empire would today be everywhere lit up with the fires of mutiny and insurrection. In the labor movement, we have long ago learned that it is the worker who is convinced of the power of the capitalist, who believes that the big fellows are sure to win. It is he who really keeps labor in subjection, defeats strikes, and destroys trade unions. The moment the worker no longer believes in the all-conquering strength of the employer is the moment when the way opens out to the emancipation of our class. The master class realize this, and hence, all their agencies bend their energies towards drugging, stupefying, and poisoning the minds of the workers, sowing distrust and fear among them. The ruling class of the British Empire also know it, and hence they also utilize every agency to spread amongst the subject races a belief in the luck of England, in the strength of England, in the omnipotence of England. That belief is worth more to the British Empire than 10 army corps. When it goes, when it is lost, there will be an uprising of resurgent nationalities and a crash of falling empires. Should we not, therefore, admire the empire that in face of danger can yet fascinate and enthrall the minds of its slaves and keep them in mental as well as physical subjection? Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa is one of the most important figures in Irish history. A leader of the Fenian movement and a prominent member of the militant Irish Republican Brotherhood, he was immortalized in the words of Patrick Pierce's famous graveside oration, which ended with the words, the fools, the fools, the fools. They have left us our Fenian dead, and while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree, shall never be at peace. Now, his great-grandson, Williams Rossa Cole, reads a letter by Rossa's wife, Mary Jane O'Donovan Rossa, to their daughter, Margaret Daisy O'Donovan Rossa Cole, following the Easter Rising. <clears throat> Port Nabucchi, which is translated variously from the Irish as Tune of the Ghosts, spirits or fairies originates from Inish Vicolon in the Bas Blasket Islands off the southwest coast of Ireland. Over the years, mythologies of the tune's inspiration range from the natural to the supernatural, from the sound of island winds to fairy lore. Born Rose Emily Ridge, Lola Ridge was an Irish-American anarchist, poet, and champion of the working class. Politically active throughout her life, Ridge participated in protests, marches, and pickets with ferocious spirit. Her poem, The Tidings, expresses solidarity with those involved in the Easter Rising of 1916. <laughs> Issued by the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, the reading of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic by Patrick Pierce outside Dublin's General Post Office marked the beginning of the Easter Rising. Uh, in these two poems that you're about to hear, one of Ireland's greatest literary figures, William Butler Yeats, cultivated powerful imagery of a nation on the cusp of independence. In To the Rose Upon the Rood of Time, Yeats represents Ireland through the traditional symbolism of the rose, suffering and dying on the cross, beautiful, tragic, hoping for resurrection. One of the most powerful political poems of the 20th century, Easter 1916, is Yeats' testament to the events which would come to define Ireland's contemporary nationhood. Regarded as the unofficial county anthem of County Tipperary, Sleeve Naman is based on a poem by Irish revolutionary Charles Kickham, 
which recounts the slaughter of United Irishmen on the slopes of Slievenamon Mountain during the 1798 rebe uh, rebellion. The lyrics are presented from the perspective of an exile. I see his blood upon the rose is based on a poem by poet, journalist, and key figure in the Easter Rising, Joseph Plunkett, who was executed by a British firing squad in Richmond Barracks at the age of 28. As Ireland's industrial center, Belfast suffered particularly during the Great Depression. We have got to go round and make a collection from door to door, from corner to corner, because this is a very serious fight we have embarked upon. If the relief workers are beaten, then all I can say is, heaven help the destitute workers of Belfast this winter. If we are beaten now, the Guardians will further cut the scale of relief. They will become more brutal in their attitude to you and yours. The coming attack on the dole will be put across us. But if we win, then they will have to increase the scale of relief. Also, task work will be abolished, and we will make it impossible for the government to reduce unemployment benefit in a few weeks' time. Consequently, we have got to win, and not to ask ourselves, can we win? We must win. We must have more of the spirit of Birkenhead and Invergordon. We have got to get results in this desperate fight. We have got to win. And no matter what the costs or sacrifices may be, we will win. Fellow workers, we have got to win this fight. If we don't win it, the future will only hold for us the same mass misery, mass poverty, and mass destitution. If we don't lift sufficient money to feed the wives and children of the strikers and the relief workers, then we have got to remember that in this city there is plenty of food and clothes and by God we are not going to allow one of our kiddies or women to starve. It has been suggested that we are not fair in demanding action, that we should have waited to allow the guardians to consider our case. Well, for the past number of years task work has been our portion. Deputation after deputation went to the guardians. What was the answer of the guardians? Every appeal made to them and based on humanitarian grounds was refused. The only way to make these people recognize the destitution that exists is the way we have taken. And if the strike lasts over the week, we have got to realize and consider what our next step is going to be. If the guardians don't give concessions by the methods we are using, then we have got to take other methods and wring from them concessions. And we are going to do it. Now, if the strike goes into next week, we are calling a strike of the school children. We will ask the parents of these school children not to send them to school next week or for as long as the strike lasts. And on the question of rent, individually, my advice to you is to pay no rent. No rent is to be paid until the strike is over or pay no tick men. I suggest that you don't want to pay rent because if the strike lasts for any considerable time and you're behind with your rent and they attempt to evict you, Christ help the people who attempt to put you out. Not a penny of rent to be paid next week and no children to be sent to school. We will have mass demonstrations and if we do not have an answer from the guardians before the end of the week, we will have a midnight mass demonstration through the city of Belfast. Let our slogan be, no surrender to poverty, misery and destitution. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was an Irish-American labor leader, activist, and feminist who played a leading role in the industrial workers of the world. She was a founding member of the American Civil Liberties Union. Here, she defends herself during the Smith Act trial of 1952, when she and other members of the Communist Party were arrested for conspiracy to overthrow the United States government. She was convicted and served a two-year sentence. Your Honor. Bernadette Devlin stood for election to the British Parliament at the age of 21. She represented the Nationalist Independent Unity Party and promised to take her seat in government rather than abstain from the illegitimate parliament. This is her first speech to the House of Commons, where she was elected as the youngest woman ever to have served. 
The bog side, which she refers to here, is a majority Catholic neighborhood in Derry, Northern Ireland, which shares a border with the mainly Protestant Fountain area. Born into a Catholic family in County Derry, poet Seamus Heaney's vast canon of work was immensely impacted by his surroundings and details of his upbringing. Heaney became modern North of Ireland's most prominent voice, describing its farms and cities beset with civil strife and its culture and language overrun by English rule. This poem, From the Republic of Conscience, was commissioned by Amnesty International Ireland to mark International Human Rights Day. It has since inspired a generation of human rights activists. <laughs> Derek Mahan's poem, A Shed, a disused shed in County Wexford, describes a derelict building in the grounds of a burnt out hotel in County Wexford from Civil War days. The poem presents us with a powerful global perspective considering the plight of people who have known suffering, injustice, abandonment, catastrophe over many centuries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the great Steve Earle. We end tonight. On Gleach, Shinya Era, Shinya Shin na Kuholan is an Halich Vera, Na na Flaha, Faro Ershan Riv Eg de Christ, Shinya Era, Oigashin na an Pirshach is a Kunala, Na Childers, a Hraik Love Lyosan a Skila. We are Ireland, older than Kuholan and the Hag of Bear than the chieftains our ancestors served before the death of Christ. We are Ireland, younger than Pierce and Connolly, than Childers, who shook hands with his own executioners. We are those who went away and those who remained, those who came and stayed, the sons and daughters of all the dreamers. Our dreams may yet become us. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome the company on stage, please? <laughs> Old Hannah, Kieran Hines, Brian Jones, Jeffrey Arend, Griffin Dunn, Susan McKeown, <laughs> Williams, Rossa Cole, Ivan Goff, Amber Tamlin. Mercedes Rule, Isabel O'Connell, Marin Ireland, Geraldine Hughes, Steve Earle.